coming to you by way of the not-for-profit mainframe studios at 900 Kia Way in downtown Des Moines, and by way of Art Week TV, this is a special live edition of 900 Views, a podcast about building community through the arts as we build an arts community. I'm your host, Pat Bodhi, and I'd like to welcome my guest, comedian and visual artist, Leo Bird. Leo is a graduate of Central College in Pella. Leo has autism, and originally his comedy was kind of specifically about that, but he has found his themes are truly universal. Leo creates drawings as meaningful prompts for his comedy routines, and it's safe to say uh, Leo's comedy goes beyond the commonplace with or without the drawings, because as his work often leans toward motivation. So comedy, art, autism, and motivation Leo puts it all together. So Leo, I was liking to just ask you a really simple starter question because I just never really thought that a person who has to face autism every day would necessarily want to try their hand at comedy. But you did and you do. So tell me how that came to be. Well, uh, I actually started as a novelist. Uh, how it happened was that when I got into how it started was that when I got into arguments with like my parents, I would sort of write up something about how I was feeling. And then I had, I had taken a class called writing short stories in college mm -hmm. that taught me how to write true stories in the vein of J.D. Salinger and Ernest Hemingway and F. Scott Fitzgerald. Wow. And, I, and when I took the class, I didn't like it too much because I found it hard to think of really good things to write about. But then I got a stroke of inspiration. And in, when I was in an interview for an internship for people with disabilities, he said, the person who was interviewing me said that I could be somebody who teaches people about autism and I got the idea to do that by telling a true story and so and so I talked to a class called students with exceptionalities because I told the career counselor at my school about the idea and she liked it and she connected it with the teacher uh -huh. because I that class wasn't within my major, but uh, but I had so much more that I wanted to say, and I I thought my story was important, but I didn't know how to put myself out there. So I I got I joined a website called critique circle to get feedback on my stories and i got some and i got some really good feedback on a story called fitting in mm -hmm. and then and then i joined a writer when i moved to des moines i joined a writer's workshop at the des moines public library and and one day I did a Google search for open mics in Des Moines. I don't know what made me, uh, what inspired me to do that. Yeah. And I, and I found an open mic out at Vaudeville Muse, and most of the people who were performing were rappers, but there was one other comedian. He told me that there was an open mic night for comedy at Lefties, and he. And I started performing at Lefties. What made you decide to put the comedy in it? Um, I mean, as opposed to just telling the story, what, what, what made you think that being funny, being a comedian, was part of the pathway you wanted to pursue? Well, I think it's just the way the story is told that makes it funny. Okay. And like people are like laughing. And I, and I think that my, I used, before I started stand up, I used to like to sing, like I was famous for singing Love Shack in college and I sung in a few bands in college. So I think my singing skills transferred to stand up comedy. 
Okay. What made you decide to start putting visual arts in it? You do these drawings or illustrations and work with them as part of your routine. What made you decide to go that path? It's a little bit different. Well, uh, it's just the process of, uh, of sort of improving yourself as a comedian because what I do is that I record my performances and see where people are laughing and uh, that t tells me that I should try and figure out why this line was funny so I can make more jokes like that. And in one of my sets, I just threw in a drawing that compared a, a dormitory that had 10 dorm rooms with two people in it and one dormitory with, with one dormitory room with 20 people in it. And uh, that was the funniest part of the set. So that made me decide to use drawings in my other sets. Mm -hmm. and, and, it's, and, and when I figured out how to make the drawings com best compatible with my comedy that took me a couple of times that I figured out that I needed to use a that I, that I needed to make my drawings really big and I and that I needed to use a that I needed to point to the drawings using a laser pointer I found mm -hmm. that people really liked it and that that inspired me to read graphic memoirs and I now notice that the that when I read comic strips, they're like a lot easier to read than than like text novels. Yeah. Like like with political cartoons. So you're making some various connections all over with the art and what people are responding to all kind of goes together there for you with your and you're making choices based on what people are laughing about. And the visualization of it is helpful for everybody, is what it sounds like to me. Is that, is yeah. that right? Well, well mm -hmm. oh, go ahead. Oh, I think, I think it might have been lagging on your end. Oh, oh, okay. So how do you make your ultimate choices about what to include in your performances? Is it really about uh, what people are laughing at? Or is there more to it than that? Well, there's a little bit more to it than that. I, I choose to write about times where somebody told me that I did a good or a bad job handling a situation or about a time when I noticed that somebody else did a really good or a bad job handling a situation or maybe like a, about like a time where I felt really happy or really uncomfortable, but I can't really put a finger on it. And uh, I think that one suggestion that one people make with, made to me was that, hey, you're a Lyft driver and you must have a lot of good stories to tell as a Lyft driver. And I think that is sort of true, but I think my mind really thinks of more of concepts that I want to teach people that, and I use my life experiences to sort of illustrate the ideas that I have in my head. So, so what are you hoping audiences will get from your performances? What, what do you want them to go home with? Well, that's a good question. I think I think I sort of wanted to enlighten people to things that I might, the challenges that I might face and sort of serve as a role model for other people. And uh, maybe to erase some misconceptions that people have, like, I did a set about 
what what is being what does being patient mean? Mm -hmm. And I think that some people might think they know what it means, but they don't really. I'll bite. What does it mean? <laughs> well, I think it was it was it was kind of a long set, but I think that the three sub that the three categories that I talked about were being courageous, being tolerant, and being able to wait. And somehow you manage to weave this together so people find humor in it, but at the same time, those three words, courage, tolerance, and waiting, sound pretty motivational as well. Yeah. That's got to be pretty challenging work to get done. Um, how has your work changed now as you face the limitations of the pandemic? Uh, I don't think you're driving um, for Lyft anymore. Is that right? Or am I mistaken there? Correct. I am not driving through Lyft. And my, my job at the post office is not affected by coronavirus. But uh, I also uh, used to volunteer at Link Associates. That has been affected by it, uh, coronavirus, so there aren't any volunteer opportunities right now, I don't think. And uh, the open mics in Des Moines were closed for a while, so I decided to take stand-up lessons online but now they've reopened. Are we going to be able to find you at an open mic sometime soon or? Uh, yes, yes I will. And uh, actually somebody from one of the op who open mics told me that he even wanted to put me on a show. Oh, cool. Oh. I got to go back to though something you mentioned earlier just a moment ago. You talked about learning stand up online. Mm -hmm. That I just can't comprehend that. How do you learn about stand up? I always thought stand up comedy was the kind of thing you pretty much just had to get out there and do it and learn it the hard way. But there's lessons online. Yeah, there are lessons online. Uh, it's through a video chat. Mm hmm. And uh, and everybody just like sort of, I think everybody just talks about what they liked about each person's performance, mm -hmm. and that and maybe the teacher might give me give me some feedback on my performance too. You mentioned wanting to kind of dispel some of the myths or misconceptions about uh, autism and you and how you might be a, a role model for people. What what do you see people thinking or misunderstanding or not knowing about autism that we can learn more by hearing you and, and paying attention to the work you do? I mean, I must confess, obviously, I started this interview saying I had not really thought about someone who has to face autism pursuing comedy. I had that misconception in my head. So I'm sure there are other things out there, probably people like me unwittingly placing some level of limitation on, on what you might want to pursue. Well, uh, I will tell you that there there are a lot of uh, people with autism who have uh, written memoirs about having autism, like Noki Higashida, uh, Ido Kadar, uh, David Finch, and John Elder Robeson. Those are all, and uh, all, also Hannah Gadsby is a stand-up comedian who has autism. And, and so uh, one thing that sort of surprised me is that uh, when I write stories, it is a learning experience for me too, because I'm, I'm learning that some of my fears are a lot more universal than I thought they were. 
and uh, I I think that uh, that people might be that with my comedy, people might be able to relate to me more. And, I, and with my uh, and in the and in the two sets I wrote about my cousin Jack Tron who also has autism, but is nonverbal and has uh, some more behavioral challenges like rocking back and forth or like pouring water from a cup. I think they might be able to uh, relate to him, to understand him better. So there's a lot there for really unlimited possibilities and at the same time understanding some of the different aspects of autism that people might not otherwise understand, but for getting to hear you and your stories and your experiences. And then also there's this really beautiful piece that so much of what you experience is truly universal. Uh, fear hits us all and your fears, for example, are more universal. That's really pretty powerful stuff. Um, what, what about working in art and comedy together? What does that mean to you personally, being able to work at that intersection of art and comedy? What does that do for you personally? Well, I think like how it uh, sort of makes me feel better about myself. Well, I certainly feel a lot more confident in myself because people really, because people say they agree with a lot of the things that I write about and they, and they, when they watch me perform, they say, Hey, I really like your set. And it makes me feel better about myself because I know that there are many other people that feel this way. I'm not alone in my struggles. And some people say, hey, I agree with what she said and that makes me feel better. So there's a lot of affirmation that comes from doing this work. Correct. So since this is always uh, a little bit of my goal is to think about how arts and uh, intersect with our community and can strengthen our community. And um, you're the first comedian I've gotten to talk to uh, for this podcast. So it's really interesting to me when, when you think about the visual work you do, the visual arts, and you think about the comedy and just your overall uh, presentations, how does your work help strengthen our community. And I think there's a couple of ways to think about that. One is perhaps, as you've mentioned, uh, for the community of people who have autism, being a role model there is probably a pretty far powerful piece and a strengthener, but there's also the community at large. And I don't wanna answer the question for you because I know you've got thoughts. So how does your work strengthen our community? And there's more than one community to think about. Well, one thing that I forgot to mention to you is that uh, stand-up comedians who use drawings in their sets are sort of rare. Yeah. But, it, but there is the stand-up comedian Dimitri Martin who uses drawings in his sets, and I think there. I think I I watched a Kevin Hart stand-up special where he sort of had a background uh, for, that like changed depending on what story he was talking about. And I think that like Adam Sandler was able to like make a rap song where like the images on the projector changed depending on what he talked about. And it was really funny. But uh, I remember there was this one time where I did a set called what is autism and I sort of sort of defined about how it affected me and then 
after I performed, someone from the audience told me that his son recently got diagnosed with autism and that he appreciated me standing up there and talking about it. And, and I know that I also know in the Iowa Autism Society of Iowa, I think that there was a, a group of, of maybe older people who met and they talked about autism and they really enjoyed hearing about uh, people in their adult lives who who have grown to be successful. Well, I think you can count yourself on that list. Uh, I mean, that's pretty amazing, really, the work that you do. And obviously, it is a community strengthener in so many ways, as you've just cited. Uh, people inspired by your work, people finding universal themes in your work, you finding universal themes in your work, and people also getting a greater understanding of what it means to have autism and recognizing all of the possibilities. Before we close, can you tell us what you're doing for Art Week so that people can catch your Art Week stuff? Uh, I'm going to be uh, performing one of my sets over Zoom and they're just talking about my artwork, like how I make it. And I've got a Facebook a, event on it. I think it's called Leo's Art Discussion. Great. And uh, is there a particular time? I, I think it's going to be tomorrow at 5.30. All right. So Leo's Art Discussion tomorrow at 5.30. Check it out via Art Week. And uh, Leo, what should we have talked about that we didn't? Is there anything else you'd like to say uh, to the folks watching us right now? Well, uh, maybe a, another reason why uh, art is such a powerful tool in storytelling is that there is a thing called the pictorial superiority effect that says that we remember uh, ideas better, that we remember a certain idea presented by text better if it is accompanied by a photo and also <laughs> that our brain and encodes pictures different than it does text. So when you do stand up there and you tell your stories and you've got pictures and you've got you, we're going to get a good powerful image that we'll remember. Correct. I'm going to remember you, Leo, and I can't wait to see you uh, do your bit either via Art Week or uh, at some open mics, mic night soon. So uh, we follow you on Facebook is one way to do that, to track you. Yep. All right. That's Leo Bird, B-I-R-D. And I can't thank you enough. It's been a delight to get to visit with you. Thank you so much, Leo. Let's stay in touch. Take care. All right. And everybody, pay attention to all that's happening for Art Week. It's uh, outstanding. And also, there's a 900 Views podcast out there with Brittany Brooke Crow, who's also one of the Art Week artists. So please catch that if you possibly can. Our thanks to Rachel Boozy and all of the Art Week team. And Leo, thank you. And thank you, folks, uh, for watching and listening to Leo Bird and myself, Pat Bode, on this edition of 900 Views. Thank you. <laughs>